question that would come to your mind is that I've mastered the art of T lift. What uh, pushes me to doing a PLF? You know, if I can do that much, why should I even bother learning PLF? I think the answer lies in the bottom line that uh, simply because you can do it, it doesn't make it an indication to do a procedure. And uh, most of us are falling into that trap very easily now because we are mastering new techniques and we're forgetting that the old techniques have stood the test of time and they were there for a reason. And the new, new does not necessarily mean better. Uh, and when you see, these are all my cases, when you see uh, complications like these in your own hands, um, uh, loosening, uh, I've, I've put a cage that went into the chest finally. Uh, we've had infections in uh, T-Lift, we've had uh, fractures, we've had uh, these kind of pseudo-arthrosis. And they can really hit you on your face because you've messed around with the disc space, which is uh, a forbidden zone as far as biology is concerned. Uh, you better get it right or else, uh, like they say, shit can hit the fan. It can really hit big if, if uh, the problem happens here. Having said that, the topic uh, is surgical tips to achieve a posterolateral fusion. And that's like, I feel like a guy trying to sell chai in a multi-specialty restaurant. Like, what's the big deal? Just open there and put some bone graft. So uh, all of you can criticize that process uh, just like you can criticize chai in, uh, in a good restaurant. But I'm going to take it uh, one step at a time anyway. I think the first is biology. Uh, pick your patient right. Try to not try to stay away from smokers. Our tendency is to ask them for smoking uh, history of smoking, but in our country, ask them for history of tobacco intake because that's far more common than smoking. Uh, use of NSAIDs. Most of these guys have been on pills for a long time, and that clearly it's been uh, shown that NSAID in, uh, intake can uh, slow down your or, or hamper your fusion rates. Osteoporotics, this becomes a bugbear because most of the patients that come to you are osteoporotic. The ones who fall into this category where you have to decide between fusion or not fusion, they're all osteoporotic and osteoporotic bones are well known not to heal. Uh, there is a case for using higher end anti-osteoporotic medication now as the orthopods are doing in fracture healing. Uh, there is some, uh, you know, some, um, uh, some sounds coming from different quarters about using uh, teriparatide for spinal fusion for a short duration. There's no uh, dic dictat on it, so I'm not going to say any more about it. Of course, albumin in our country, again, malnutrition. Uh, as far as biomechanics is concerned, if you're aiming to achieve a good fusion, choose the right spine. So don't look for a spine that has an overt translation or an overt instability or someone with, uh, uh, who has a kyphosis like this at the lumbosacral junction. Because if you're going to put a graft there, the graft is going to be at the mercy of the center of gravity, which is way, way ahead and the graft is going to bend because by the time the fusion is achieved, the center of rotation is way ahead and the graft finally bends and uh, non-union rates are much higher. And uh, this takes us discreetly to the, you know, to the hidden corner of, or, or to, the, uh, uh, to the place where you don't want to go, and that is the uh, angles of the pelvis. But uh, again, it tends to correlate well that if your sacrum is more flat, the chances of uh, you achieving a fusion are slightly better than if your sacrum is more vertical. This is a very broad and very uh, uh, simplistic way of looking at a very complicated uh, part, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, so choose subtle instabilities, choose big transverse processes. In your first few cases, make sure that, especially L5, the transverse process can be a real small stub, and uh, that, that gives you very little uh, area to, to, uh, to put bone graft on. So look for big transverse processes. Look for these uh, L5s, that, if you're doing an L5-S1, uh, look for these L5s that are into the uh, pelvic cavity rather than L5s that stand out. So if, the, if it's a low-lying L5, you're better off looking at a fusion. And though such famous slides can do the rounds, this is a high-grade, high-kyphotic, high-dysplastic kind of uh, uh, listhesis that has been treated with an uninstrumented fusion. And a lot of bravado is made from these slides. I think in your hands, as you heard from Siddharth's very elegant talk, uh, you got to put implants. So if you're Wanting to achieve a good posterolateral fusion, back it up with implants. Uh, don't try to be uh, the guy who published the last slide because uh, it's not going to work, work in your hands. Uh, having said that, you must, we must know the difference between posterior fusion and posterolateral fusion. In a rare situation where you don't have to do a laminectomy, uh, your posterior fusion is going to really work well because you have a great broad area for bone grafting because this is a fight for the bed. Uh, the whole issue about doing fusion only from the posterior after a laminectomy is that there's no bed. There's no bone available to put the bone graft on. So if your laminae were intact for some reason, these are very rare cases where you don't do a laminectomy and still want to do a fusion. Um, I think you're, you're at a much better wicket than uh, otherwise. 
coming to the moot point that how do you actually go stepwise in the, uh, this uh, procedure of PLF and I must confess that I do a fair share of PLFs in my practice uh, e even though uh, you know TLIF has been uh, uh, has been the running procedure so the art of fusion involves um, a good soft tissue clearance and uh, you know not enough can be said about how to do soft tissue clearance there are few tips that figured down there in the corner uh, it tells you that the muscles are attached in a way that they are uh, you know oblique towards the like fanning out into the uh, caudal region so you start from bottom to top so you le leave the least amount of soft tissue hanging on the bone and the figure there is much more indicative because that's the problem we see in uh, uh, junior surgeons exposing that you go for a paramedian uh, ex exposure so you take a midline incision and go on either side of the uh, spinous process without realizing that the spinous process is like a mushroom and a lot of bunches of soft tissue will be left under that chaja or the roof and unless you take your cautery down like that and skirt the bone you're going to leave a lot of soft tissue behind and all this is going to come in the way of your fusion in future so make sure that you stick to bone when you dissect go all the way out uh, to the tips of the transverse processes mind you it does not mean that you need to take a bigger incision because most of these patients are uh, surgeon friendly so to say they have uh, sarcopenia weak muscles so with a small incision they can retract all the way and uh, you don't really have to take larger incisions uh, remember to run your uh, cautery all the way along the bone the shape of the bone and create a kind of a submuscular pocket so uh, we all used to this kind of an exposure where we go facet to facet but uh, you got to then push yourself away and climb the hill of the facet so to say walk your way down on the ridge of the the outer ridge of the facet where you'll find a McNabb's bleeder it's an artery coming from the uh, lateral edge of the facet so to catch it you need to use an artery faucet which is curved so the artery comes out from here not from here so you got to the, the surgeon needs to hold the instrument that goes like this and catches that artery otherwise uh, it's uh, not a vein so it's not going to stop bleeding after that make uh, make your plane along the transverse process all the way to the tip expose the transverse process cordocephalide completely and then create this kind of a submuscular pocket this is very important because uh, the vascularity of this muscle is now well maintained it's well preserved and you have a good uh, good bunch of tissue that's going to sit back when you put the graft in there so uh, this is one of the keys uh, the other is when you look at the frontal plane you got to dissect all the way down uh, to the flat of the transverse process invariably what happens is that there are two transverse processes a bunch of tissue in between that won't do you got to go flat down tp to tp uh, to to the point where the muscles get over you keep dissecting and there's no more muscle and you'll find a fascia there be careful not to transgress this fascia because this fascia is your bed other than the fact that you can hit a kidney or a spleen uh, there should be something for the bone to rest on so uh, you have to just air short of that fascia or beyond the fascia but certainly don't have a bunch of muscle lying between two TPs. It's very, very common and very easy to do that, that you put your cautery on the, both the transverse processes, but you don't dissect this. You need some kind of a bone-to-bone -bone, uh, uh, level plane to work on, and that's the area that you want to work on. Uh, so this is what you look at in, uh, uh, in real life, and uh, you got to work in that plane down there, that ve uh, very uh, specific area between the two transverse processes and you got to push that down all the way till you are on the same plane and that's your lumbar dorsal fascia that needs to be exposed after this make uh, screw tracks don't put your implants in as yet but just make screw tracks because the, even the screw heads are going to come in the way of your uh, fusion so that comes in last make screw tracks but don't put the screws in uh, normally we use the locally harvested corticocancellous bone but uh, if you don't have any unfortunately you'll have to go for the iliac crest uh, uh, when we use this bone remember not to don't just give it off to the nurse if it's a new nurse you're going to store it in water like any biopsy sample and there goes your BMP so you don't don't want to do that you try to you everyone knows this take uh, you know bloody mops and try to put it there or take these kind of blood soaked uh, kidney trays where you can keep the bone this is a useful trick we take a 20 cc syringe and cut the head off and uh, pack in bone there so you can onlay the bone using a syringe and uh, it becomes easy rather than packing it with, the, with your finger. Bone substitutes, unfortunately, have not worked well at all in our practice. And I remember at least two cases of pseudoarthrosis in a PLF where we've used bone substitutes. And the CT scan shows these, at least the hydroxyapatite level bone substitutes, which are just spacers. They just look like foreigners sitting there with uh, you know, no contribution to fusion. So I would say if you don't have adequate bone graft, uh, go for the crest, but don't use uh, bone substitutes. 
Uh, however, BMP rocks. Of course, it's off the market, I'm told. But uh, in three or four cases of pseudos, pseudarthrosis, uh, where we've needed to use BMP, it fuses like fire. And, you know, dubara mat puchna type. There's a lot of issues with it, but the fusion is superb. Uh, remember that the graft that you harvest should be as long and as chunky as possible. Don't try, don't try to put bhusa over there. Put chunks. Because there is a bridge that needs to be formed, as you can see in the figure on your right. And hence, preparing the... Uh, and this graft you're going to get from the spinous process. So preparing the spinous process, denuding it of all the soft tissue before you start uh, slicing it down like this. Slice it down like this. So you can get real good chunks and slivers of bone that are long. So you're combining a bridge with biology. And uh, uh, because, you know, the first step of uh, bone fusion is resorption. So if they're very small pieces, they just go away. And then, you know, reforming. If there's a nice bridge over there, uh, it stays, maintains its anatomy. Finally, preparing the graft bed is important because um, I think we just see transverse processes. Remember, posterolateral fusion is different from intertransverse fusion. That's two different things. In a posterolateral fusion, the critical place where you fuse is the facet joints. And many of us forget that. You have to hammer into the facet joint, take away the articular cartilage. Almost every case of scoliosis, which, is, uh, which I have needed to redo, uh, I can see that the facets have remained uh, virgin. There's a sheet of bone behind, but the facets show up. So uh, it's incorrectly done fusion. You have to uh, take away the articular processes, articular surfaces. Remember, the facet is not like that. It's like this. So you can't just hammer and you've got to go all the way in with a curate or some kind of a curve. The facet does not just, it, it closes in, it hides. So you've got to go all the way in and take away the articular cartilage. Also, there's pars. And also, there's a lateral surface of the pars and the facet which needs to be uh, curated off. I'm going to stick my head out and say don't use a burr because a burr can, it's easy, but it can kill, it can necrose the very bone that you need to grow. So I would uh, say don't use a burr, use soft nibblers and uh, decorticate whichever surface area, so facet, lateral side of the articular process and the transverse process. While doing the transverse process, please don't crack it. One, uh, I mean, it's very easy to just take a nibbler and then smash the transverse process and it's fractured. And uh, that's the common problem because once it's fractured, it becomes a bone graft, not a bone bed. And you need a bed here. There's pl plenty of graft available. More than that, it uh, disrupts the fascia on which you're going to put the bed, uh, put the bone graft. So uh, try not to uh, uh, crack the pr transverse process with a nibbler uh, with two hands, very delicately just decorticate the surface and uh, use osteotomes and nibblers and avoid using burrs. And then on lay graft, uh, instead of just packing it down, you try to lay it on top of all the raw bone that you can see, uh, after which you can then put your instrumentation. And uh, that's how I would say you do your uh, posterolateral fusion. A very small topic in, you know, which had to be elaborated, but I can tell you that uh, uh, I have a teacher who's, been, who's never done an interbody cage, Dr. Bhojraj, and uh, so he must have done maybe 6,000 cases in private practice or 8,000, and he's never put an interbody cage in his life, and uh, he has very good results. So, no matter what current literature ten, you know, makes you think, just look back and see that there are people who have lived this life and done a lot of surgery without doing the procedure that they are trying to sell you. And they have had good results, so just believe that you could have, have good results with that procedure also. Thank you.